Uh, greetings from Los Angeles. I'm Jay Wong, Director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, our very first public event in 2023. Uh, this year, CPD will continue to expand its contributions to the study and practice of public diplomacy throughout research, convening, and professional education. At the start of the year, we launched a new research fellowship program focusing on public diplomacy in Southeast Asia. We are hosting a training workshop in Washington, D.C. next month on creative storytelling for public diplomacy. And we will be announcing next week the third CPD City Diplomacy Summit to be held in Los Angeles this spring. I wanted to thank you for joining us today and hope to see you in our future programs as well. For today's event, we are sharing research highlights on the role and impact of visual communication in public diplomacy. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth King, who will moderate the panel discussion. Dr. King is professor of international education and politics at New York University and founding director of NYU's minor in peace and conflict studies. She's currently a CPD research fellow. Her research focuses on war, peace, development, and education in ethnically diverse and conflict-affected contests. Her publications include Diversity, Violence, and Recognition, How Recognizing Ethnic Identity Promotes Peace, uh, published by Oxford University Press, and From Classrooms to Conflict in Rwanda by Cambridge University Press. Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for moderating today's program, and I turn the program over to you now. Thank you so much, Jay, for this kind introduction. Thank you to all our audience members who have joined us and to the terrific panelists to whom I have the pleasure of introducing you in the next few moments. As Jay mentioned, I have the pleasure of being a Center on Public Diplomacy Fellow. And the, the main motivation for me in applying to this program was to have the opportunity to meet terrific people who are doing work in this field. And that's exactly what I have the opportunity to do and to share with you this morning. So let me please go ahead and introduce, at least in alphabetical order, and only very briefly, the four panelists who you'll have the pleasure of hearing from this morning. Let me tell you just a little bit about each of them, uh, and then we'll be turning to them in turn to speak each for about eight minutes, such that our panel together runs approximately half an hour, just a little bit longer, leaving plenty of time for you, the audience members, to ask questions and for us to hear from our panelists. So audience members, I would invite you to jot down your questions in the chat at any moment uh, during the panel. And I hope we'll have a really fulsome discussion after we learn from these four distinguished people to whom I will now introduce you. First of all, we have Corneliu Biola, Associate Professor in Diplomatic Studies at the University of Oxford and head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group. Corneliu, I don't know if you want to turn on your camera to wave. He also serves as faculty fellow at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy uh, at USC and a professorial lecturer at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. For me, especially exciting that Corneliu and I were PhD students at the same time at the University of Toronto a number, I'll say an unspecified number of years ago. So it's a particular pleasure to be reunited this morning. Elizabeth, I'd like to, to say hello, but I think the host interrupted my, my video feed. So it's not oh. me. So someone okay. Th thank you. Um, we'll see if if Cesar can turn you on. All right. Here we go. You appear <laughs> from, from the digital wonder. 
Yeah, so 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 thank you very much for the kind introduction. Very happy to be here. And thank, thank you for you. reminding us, you know, the connection, the Toronto connection. It's always the most important one, you know. <laughs> it's been it's been started, some time. Everything started there. This is great. Let me now uh, turn to introducing Jennifer Cassidy, a diplomatic scholar also at Oxford University and policy advisor. She aptly researches uh, digital diplomacy and the changing face of diplomacy in the age of real-time governance. Jennifer, I don't know if you can turn yourself on to say hello. Thank you, terrific. Next, I have Dmitry Chernobrov, Associate Professor or Senior Lecturer in Media and International Politics at the Department of Journalism Studies, University of Sheffield. He's also co-director of the Digital Society Network and Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And last, but certainly not least, Ilan Menor, lecturer at the Department of Communications at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And actually, I was just there in December, Ilan, so we'll have to connect on that. Also member of Oxford University's Digital Diplomacy Research Group, and with a recent book called Digitalization of Public Diplomacy. So again, just a perfect match for the topic this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists, our first panelist will indeed be Ilan, uh, to talk about visualizing public diplomacy. And I know if you could applaud audience, you would, uh, because this is an exciting start to our panel together. Ilan, I turn it over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. I will now attempt to do the impossible and share the screen. And uh, you'll be able to tell me maybe if it's working as it should. Um, Looks terrific, Ilan. Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the CPD uh, for uh, um, helping organize this event and bringing everyone uh, together. My name is Ilan Mano, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Communications at Ben Gurion University. And I'm also a member of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group that is represented here today in full force. And what I'd like to talk to you today over the next eight minutes or so is what I call diplomats as visual narrators. And maybe we can begin with two important questions, which is why focus on visual diplomacy and why do so now? And the truth is that diplomats now publish dozens of visuals daily. And I think it could even be argued that never before have so many diplomats authored so many visuals on a daily basis. And these visuals have become an important component of both digital and public diplomacy. And I think this importance stems from the fact that we now live in a very complex world. What do I mean by a complex world? Well, we now live in a world that is characterized by a perpetual state of crisis. These crises themselves are quite intricate as they impact the interests of many states. And what we see is that local crises send global ripple effects and that global conflicts play out locally. So if we think about the Syrian civil war, the Crimean crisis, the war in Yemen, even the current war in Ukraine, we are seeing local manifestations of global or, reg or regional struggles over hegemony. And I think that diplomats now use visuals to narrate their foreign policies, but also diplomats use visuals to help people make sense of local and global events. And this is why I've termed diplomats as visual narrators. And I think that if we examine how diplomats yield images, we'll see that it's far more sophisticated than just trying to grab our attention online or on social media, but actually diplomats try to bring order to chaos. So I'd like to share with you a few examples of what I've termed visual narration. And first, we can think of diplomats' use of images as a framing device. For instance, we saw a global framing competition uh, several months ago when the US decided to withdraw from Afghanistan. And if you remember, we saw a lot of images and a lot of tweets, such as the one that appears now on the screen, published by journalists describing scenes of chaos at Kabul airport. But pretty soon, American diplomats and the American government also went online and offered their own framing of this event. And we saw a lot of images depicting American soldiers helping the civilian population in Kabul airport, helping children, even helping infants. 
And the framing here by the American government was first of an orderly withdrawal from Afghanistan, but even arguing that America was mounting a humanitarian effort in an attempt to rescue people from Afghanistan. So the message, if you want, in this type of, uh, uh, of use of images was no ally or no child will be left behind by the US. We also can look at images used by diplomats as rhetorical devices. When diplomats use an image to deliver a message that far exceeds the 140 character limit on Twitter or 280 character limit. So take for instance, this image now shown on the screen that was published by the UK Foreign Office. And it deals with a recent agreement by Iran to supply Russia with attack drones for its war in Ukraine. Now, if we look at the components of this image, for instance, the smiling faces between the two leaders, the blood soaked background, even the use of the term sordid deal to depict relations between uh, Russia and Iran, the meaning of this message might be that this was really a deal with the devil. And this is a message that far exceeds uh, both Facebook and Twitter's character limits. We can also look at how diplomats use images as ideological devices, how images enable diplomats to support a certain set of norms, values, and beliefs. Here is an interesting image that you now see on the screen. It was shared by Estonian diplomats, and it actually deals with the delivery of American weapons to the Baltic states in order to strengthen NATO's eastern flank. But what's interesting about this image is the context. And I think context is very important when we look at diplomats' image, images. Context matters. And the context here is rockets and trees. And what is a possible message that comes from this image is the naturalizing of weapons or the argument that weapons are natural in our world. They are as integral to today's world as trees. And here is the use of an image to support a certain normative claim or a belief that weapons of war can actually be a good thing or a natural thing or a necessary thing. Another interesting use of images is when diplomats use images as evidence to say that a certain event did in fact take place at a certain time. Consider this image now showed on the screen that was published by the American mission to the OSCE depicting scenes from the horrid war now taking place in Ukraine. And here, the image plays an evidentiary role. It is used by American diplomats to document what is happening in Ukraine. And we see this a lot by diplomats using images as evidence. And this is a very powerful tool because in our societies, in digital societies, seeing is believing. When we see an image from a certain place, we believe that an event did in fact take place. Finally, diplomats now use images as emotional devices to elicit certain emotions. And this is important, I believe, because emotions are a gateway to influence. So consider this image that was published recently by a Ukrainian diplomat, where we actually have a split screen. On the top, we have a picture of Russian generals at, at the feast. And on the bottom, we have the reality of the war in Ukraine now, a horrid war with much destruction and death. And split screens are always used to juxtapose two realities, one reality that is familiar and one reality that is horrid. And the power of the image comes to light when we realize that the same men, the same generals have actually created both realities. What's interesting about this example is that it shows a rather sophisticated use of visuals and specifically a sophisticated use of the split screen which has been used by filmmakers for many, many years. If you recall Woody Allen's classic film, Annie Hall, he uses the split screen to juxtapose two family dinners or even two visits to a psychologist. So what are the main conclusions of this short presentation? First, that I think we can now call diplomats visual narrators in the sense that diplomats use visuals to deliver complex foreign policy messages. And this, I believe, requires more attention from scholars. We need to understand how these images are created, be it in an embassy, a foreign ministry, or international organization. What is the process of formulating these images? Who creates images in all of these institutions? And finally, how do images speak foreign policy? When do we see that diplomats use images to narrate state policies, to narrate state action, or even to help audiences make sense 
of the world they live in. This is what I try to do in my recent CPD perspective, and I hope this is what we'll understand from today's presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilan. I had to remind myself I had a role to play on this panel because I was madly taking notes for my own work here, which uh, I feel very lucky to do. I'm going to turn it over next to Cornelio, whose um, paper is provocatively titled One Avatar to Rule Them All, Exploring New Modes of Visual Representation in the Metaverse and Their Implications for Digital Diplomacy. Cornelio? Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, thank you very much, CPD, for, for inviting me to take part in this event, as well as to the organizer, um, Ilan Mano. So what i like to, to talk about, you know, just following up on the previous presentation, is to uh, depart a little bit from um, some of the familiar um, um, frames that we got used in digital diplomacy. We know that digital diplomacy has uh, been quite innovative in terms of producing different mediums um, for, for engagement. We talk about uh, images, we talk about memes, we talk about emo emojis, and so on. But what I like to, uh, to emphasize today in, the, um, uh, in my uh, time slot is to, um, to uh, highlight the potential of a new form of visual representation. And I'm talking about avatars. And this is part of a new project that I started. It's a teaching project because I'm teaching a new course on metaverse and diplomacy, uh, but also a research project. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the point that I like to make today are basically four. One is to clarify a little bit what we mean, what, what's uh, the conceptual uh, value of, of the avatar, um, what, what does it mean? And the second point, what exactly is intriguing about avatars in terms of visual representation? How this uh, new form of uh, visual representation could relate to public diplomacy? I'm going to insist a little bit on the, on the uh, storytelling uh, aspect. And of course, also to uh, mention, uh, to conclude with some uh, discussion of the risk associated with the use of avatar in public diplomacy. So let me start with the first point. And the first point is about avatar. What exactly we mean by avatar? So avatar, basically, it's a digital alter ego. It's a digital representation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the physical ego, but also one that reflects and projects the physical ego in a virtual world together you know, with other avatars. It can be a 3D model, it can be a 2D icon. And what is important about avatars, they can be customized to reflect you know, our preferences per and personal characteristics. What is interesting about avatars, the avatars usually have this kind of sketch um, that you've seen, uh, that's, uh, you may say, you know, this is the, the cheap version. There is now a new concept, which is called digital humans. Um, and I'm going, because I don't have time to discuss much uh, about this, I'm going to post uh, a link in the chat room um, uh, to, uh, to one of these digital humans that uh, I think it's uh, 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 making uh, a good impression. Uh, it's Sophie, so uh, if the audience like to engage to uh, take a look, it can uh, get a sense of what I'm referring to. So digital humans are this highly realistic computer generated representation of a real person using AI, for instance, and they, they, they like to mimic the appearance, the movement, the expression of real humans as closely as possible. Now you may say that, you know, uh, well, digital humans are the, the, the future, in a sense, you know, uh, avatars are the past and digital humans are the future. But there is something interesting that uh, is not only about the cost of producing a digital human, it's also the fact that there is interesting theory about uh, why people may still prefer avatars instead of, of uh, digital humans for the time being. Um, and, and that has something to do with this concept, interesting concept of uncanny valley. Uh, it's about the physical, psychological reaction of people when they interact with, with avatars. Uh, so the more realistic the story goes, the more realistic, the more rejection, at least at the beginning um, from humans. So there is a spectrum, what I'm uh, talking, uh, what I'm uh, trying to clarify here is that there is a spectrum from more basic forms of digital representation, which are the avatars, and more sophisticated AI-based types of uh, uh, digital representation are the digital humans. Um, but that's, I think, all of them come under the, the umbrella of the digital, um, of, the, of the avatar, let's say, as a concept. Uh, the important thing here to remember in the case of avatar is the issue of embedded presence. To what extent you connect, you feel comfortable with 
your avatar because that uh, is very um, significant for the way in which you may engage and interact with the other in the virtual space. Uh, let me uh, go now to the second point. So now with this kind of understanding, background understanding of avatars, what is so uh, important about them that we need to pay attention in terms of visual representation? So I think the avatar brings certain things new, characteristic new that we don't have yet in the type of medium that we use in digital diplomacy. First of all, nonverbal communication. An avatar uses facial expression, body language, tone of voice, which are particularly important for engagement, for interaction, stimulating interaction, but also importantly for expressing emotions, right? The way in which you express emotions at the moment is quite passive, is quite static. Emotions in a sense become more realistic. There is also the, the, another characteristic, the question of spatia, spatiality from space. Uh, it's one is about the 3D depth of the environment in which you navigate, and that gives you a certain type of, of, of uh, immersion, but also the perspective taken, because an avatar can be used as a, uh, as a way to take different, uh, to absorb different perspectives, as a first person, as a third person engagement. I'll also emphasize the third element, which again is missing from the way in which um, we discuss about uh, visual in digital diplomacy, movement. Avatars can be designed to move in a specific ways, and that has implication. Has implication, for instance, in terms of accessibility for some people, you know, to use avatars, which to do things that are might not able to do in a physical um, a form, uh, but also for stimulating engagement. And these two, uh, these kind of characteristics, I think, are bound to um, are important for two reasons, at least two reasons. One is because they trigger new processes of meaning making. We have a, a, an interesting theory about, you know, visual. Um, uh, perceptions, which says that the way in which we process visual information is always incomplete, ambiguous, and often conflicting. That comes from Richard uh, Gregory in the 1970s, but there are many other authors discussing this. So our mind uses the way to complete, you know, to absorb visual um, uh, information is to, which is incomplete and sometimes ambiguous, is to use our previous experience, knowledge, and beliefs to make sense and to put together a particular frame and image. And I think this is an important element because uh, visual perception is not only a passive element of absorbing information, but also a process or active process of creating based on our knowledge and experience. And this is where I think avatar can contribute, right, in a way which is more meaningful than, for instance, uh, uh, traditional ways, because it, it encourages this kind of process of engagement. A second element, which is particularly interesting, is also what is called the Proteus effect. It's a phenomenon in which people's behavior and self-perception is affected by their self-representation. Uh, and we have a number of studies explaining that um, uh, basically people, uh, in a sense, tend to be more cooperative, tend to be more um, uh, uh, confident, um, sometimes, you know, uh, more uh, engaged in, uh, in, in activity, uh, if they are comfortable with their digital representations. In other words, you're, the way in which you operate in the virtual has a behavior implication also for your uh, physical um, um, uh, conduct. So that is interesting. So there are certain characteristics that seem to make avatar as a mode, as a new form of visual representation, you know, quite, quite an intriguing, intriguing, uh, intriguing medium. But how does it relate to public diplomacy? And I'm going to highlight uh, three things. And it's, all of them deal with this new uh, um, idea of storytelling that has emerged in public diplomacy as a very important because it's a, as a tool, it allows for the creation of a narrative that can be easily understood by people and communicated to various audiences, uh, building empathy, understanding, and the relationship with foreign audiences. So one way in which avatar can contribute to storytelling in public diplomacy is through personalization. Avatars can be designed, right, to interact with individuals in a way that is consistent with their expectations or prior experiences. So they can create a sense of self-edification that in increases engagement uh, in the interaction. Another element is uh, really create an immersive experience. Storytelling could include more interactive elements in which avatar can engage the audience to jointly take certain type of activities, which is missing, again, from the type of uh, engagement that we have now in digital diplomacy. 
And that's important because it increases the feeling of authenticity and creates a deeper emotional connection with the narrative and the underlying message. Finally, there is also this issue of co-participation and co-creation. Avatars can um, enable the audience to explore and interact with them, create their own stories and you know, disseminate and share them further. So I think these three elements, personalization, immersive experience, and co-participation, co-creation, I think three elements, uh, three aspects by which um, I think uh, avatars could uh, could enhance the way in which storytelling is, uh, is done in in uh, in this. So I'm going to conclude here with just uh, uh, highlighting some risk. And the risk, of course, the, the figures, the, the elements that make uh, avatars so important for public diplomacy also bring, you know, um, a certain certain uh, disadvantages. Uh, with avatars, you can easily imper imper uh, uh, impersonate, you know, others, uh, and that's, I think, you know, it's a it's an issue that can lead to uh, increased disinformation, increase um, instead of facilitating relationship building, you actually destroy this kind of relation. You can amplify this information simply because, you know, these avatars never sleep, right? I mean, they are all, in a sense, you know, the way they are like the bot, but in a, with a human face. And it can also increase because of their customization, they can also increase the, pro, uh, the potential for manipulation. So exactly the same uh, characteristic that can help avatars become a more uh, constructive to public diplomacy, uh, present also the the the, the negative uh, come also with the negative uh, implications for uh, disseminating or enhancing the deformation. The conclusion, my conclusion, I think, avatar represents a new form of visual representation with unique uh, unique characteristics that potentially they have uh, um, uh, quite you know can exert a significant impact. But you also have to be careful about uh, their uh, ability to be used for disinformation or propaganda and to start thinking more carefully about how to address this right now before it's becoming too uh, uh, chronic. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cornelio. I've certainly jotted down many questions for you for our Q&A, and I want to remind our audience that you're always welcome also to jot down your questions and enter them into the Q&A so that they can get into our queue for our panelists um, after we hear from two more distinguished speakers. So I'm going to turn now, please, to Jennifer Cassidy. Moving from avatars, now to look at a particular case study. Jennifer is going to speak to us about Through the Looking Glass, Images, Power, and Revolutions in Context, focusing on the Iranian Revolution 2022-2023, super contemporary. Please, Jennifer. Jennifer, we see your screen, but we don't yet hear you. I Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, I love the way I sometimes I'd say, oh, I have a PhD in technology, yet cannot unmute on Zoom. So <laughs> always an awkward situation like that. Um, however, I just wanted to say before I begin, um, thank you so much to um, USC for putting on this wonderful webinar on a very much needed topic. And I am lucky enough to be a departmental lecturer at the, this year for the Diplomatic Studies Programme. Um, in Oxford, which um, has a number of uh, 30 serving diplomats from countries all around the world. And I was lucky enough to discuss with them on our digital diplomacy lecture this Tuesday. And so there was a lot of input in, in there from uh, 30 different countries and, and their foreign ministries on how they view visualization as well. So that's not part of my eight minutes. I'm going to time myself because as my colleagues know, <laughs> This is going to be a challenge for me, but I will do my um, absolute best. So we have here through uh, the through the looking glass. Um, if I can just, why is this not? Sorry, is this not moving? Oh yeah, okay. Sorry, bear with me. Okay, two moments. Sorry. This is, we want to present, but we want to, yes, here we go. Okay, there it is. Okay, so if we don't get through with the eight minutes, the uh, agenda, we can look at this at the Q&A. Iran, images and the revolution, looking at a historical outlook, connecting the world, in, 
key images that spread across the world during the um, 2002-2003 Iranian Revolution. Particularly, I want to focus on citizen diplomacy um, and how these images created a shared meaning throughout the international community. And looking at the question, and we can answer this in the Q&A, what is the purpose of these images? What power do they create? What is their impact? And ultimately, who are they impacting? Are they getting to the sources of power who are going to change policy? The area I'm really going to zone in on is the conceptual power and the impact of these images, which can be used for comparative analysis for, for any um, a re revolution under an authoritarian regime in a digital age. Um, and then if I can get to it with time, Iran, uh, Iran <laughs> reacts, and that is how Iran is now using visual technology such as AI um, and facial recognition to use and to make arrests and ultimately cease the process and then um, the conclusion. So um, looking at this briefly, Iran images and the revolution, this is nothing new. And when we look at visualization and public diplomacy, if we look at political crisis, what, no matter what we look at, and that is exactly what I learned from my PhD, uh, it is anything about digital diplomacy, it is an evolution, not a revolution. So this is nothing new. So Iranian women, although they did not stage mass public demonstrations again against restrictions on their freedoms for nearly three decades following the 1979 Islamic Revolution, um, there were um, huge protests before, just before this against the compulsory uh, wearing of the hijab laws, uh, but they were brutally crushed um, by the Islamic regime. So these images are very reflective, you know, of what we are see of what we are seeing today, but we just don't have the digital means to connect them and have that connect and shared meaning for citizen diplomacy. So citizen diplomacy and how these images created a, um, a shared meaning throughout the international community is also linked to the key images that spread across the world. And I realize this is very fast, but, you know, eight minutes <laughs> for me, as I said, uh, is, uh, is, you know, quite a challenge. So these are the key images, of course. Um, we have Masha Ami, who was the first um, um, uh, victim who was brutalized by the morality police and killed for showing one um, piece of hair, which will be a continuing theme to the visualization and images that we see that actually connected um, the world and her face and her name uh, became and created shared collective meaning through citizen diplomacy around, uh, around the world. So this is in um, Iran. We saw these key, um, really, really um, prominent images. Images such as these, this that that met not just women but men coming out on the streets, um, to protest the mistreatment of women by the morality police. These images spread much faster, as we see from the data, um, actually at the start of the revolution, and um, that it was the whole of society and um, and um, joining in. Then we had these these uh, quite really. Um, undertoned visual and visualization techniques, which I feel are being used more and more today, particularly under oppressive regimes. And that is this thing that people don't know, it's called White Wednesday, and it was created by actually a Canadian who's in exile um, in Iran. And that is for women who wanted to show their support for the protests and wanted to go out, but also, of course, wanted to protect themselves, would wear white, but in complete um, coherence with the morality police. But the white would show that they were in support, but they were still um, wearing um, wearing and covering the themselves as the morality police um, wished. And then we saw this went across the world then, where this is with Pink Floyd artists who had uh, Mashami's name across the stage. And this was reported on by the Iranian press. The images were across the screen at the concert the whole time. Uh, there was also um, Instagram videos, all th these visualization tools that, again, were just an evolution of what we saw in the 1979 um, protests. And I'm going to go, go through these quickly, but what? please take a look at these. I can send them on, on this um, this this um, Prezi to people if they wish to, to look at it further. But this was Paris, and, and just look at exactly all the images, the collective meanings, same images being shown again. Because it was that piece of hair that was started 
of and was actually uh, was the in initiation of and uh, the visualization of actually you know the immorality um of that um really uh, of Mashemi who was killed this was in Paris um, a man shaving his head uh we also saw uh, in Turkey again the same images if you look in the background for we for women, freedom, life, these slogans were everywhere and spread digitally online. Ministries were also posting them. Hair cutting, this is in front of the Brandenburg Gates in Berlin. Um, this is in Istanbul, people cutting their hair, women, freedom and life. And all this was organized, all this visualization was done through Twitter, um, through Facebook and through Telegram and other social media apps. Uh, this is the product of um, that, that, that tweet that I just showed you that's in um, um, Los Angeles. We saw all these images, women, life, freedom. Uh, this is by uh, a really famous Belgian artist um, on, on Instagram. And this is in, in, in Washington. And this is even in Afghanistan where women uh, under the threat of their life were going out with pictures of uh, Mashi and me and with women, life, freedom um, also uh, written. So this was the connectivity and citizen diplomacy of this was everywhere. Uh, but my real fo uh, the, the, the focus on it that I uh, want to get to here is conceptual power and, and impact of these images, uh, both national and Iran and worldwide, which you can use a comparative analysis. We won't read all that because um, we've gone through this. But so the use in images by protesters has been a central practice of resistance in other protests around the world. Uh, in the Arab Spring, we saw this. This was, you know, across the ruling regimes that spread across the Middle East and North Africa in the early 2010s. Um, and these images played an important role in mobilizing people, you know, and, and joining the movement. One of the first times we saw it. Um, and this picture is quite confronting, and I was hesitant to put it in, but um, I, 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 I chose, I did chose to, to, to put it in. But it's a woman. It's a photo of a woman who was dragged by government forces in the streets of Egypt with her body exposed, and this ultimately persuaded many to protest against what was a clear example of state violence in the Egyptian uprising. And that photo became a symbolic symbol um, um, everywhere. And I just before I end, I just want to do five what resistance means digital um, uh, digital and offline. So what does this mean? Well, studies on visuals hold a marginal position in the literature compared to text based social media research on, for example, tweets or comments. Studies tell us a lot about why visuals form a significant part of digital inter interactions. Number three, visual context has unique cognitive effects, which often helps to generate more interest in a movement. And because words can only speak of one thing at a time, but images arrive holistically, making everything present simultaneously, they are especially well suited to amplify the emotions of sadness and rage that motivate people to take part in protests. And visuals are also an important medium of activist communication because of their combined in interests in engaging audiences and they help movements and gain visibility in the public sphere. I won't go through all of this um, because I said I will, I will uh, put it on. And just the, the very, very last thing is, I just want to say how Iran is re reacting. Uh, they are now using, it is confirmed by the Iranian officials, uh, AI and facial recognition visualization um, to, um, to identify women. And I'll just end with the quote that the head of the Iranian government agency that enforces morality said in September that the, that the technology will be used to, quote, identify inappropriate and unusual movements, including the failure to observe the hijab laws. Individuals could be identified by checking faces against a national uh, um, identity database, which has been created since 2015, to levy arrests, and also ultimately they're shutting down mass communications and, and, the, and the internet. And the questions, I won't conclude because the time, and I can't believe I'm only two minutes over that is a miracle for me um looking forward what next for iran is there such a thing as image image fatigue in a, in a thing uh regime change i don't think we're going to answer that today um or ever um at this moment and um, questions and answers most welcome thank you easy to speak that fast thank you so much and thank you for giving me the leverage of those two minutes very much appreciated 
Well, thank you, Jennifer. You know, it's such a pleasure to chair a panel like this and to learn so much. And the worst part is having to stop these fascinating, fascinating conversations. So we're going to get to come back to you, I hope, in the Q&A. But let's not shortchange Dimitri, who's our last presenter today. Uh, Dimitri, let's turn to you. You're going to tell us about the clash of images, humorous versus serious politics in public diplomacy reception. I think complements really well what we've heard so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you to everybody who has joined us today. Thank you for the invitation. So yes, um, today in the um, in the panel so far, we have focused on serious messaging about serious politics. But in a way, what I'm going to talk about is the introduction of entertainment, particularly in the form of sarcasm, irony, mockery or ridicule, in other words, humor into public diplomacy. And also, I'm going to look at how that is received by audiences. So um, there's an increased in, there are increased instances and even whole campaigns that are based on humor in public diplomacy today, particularly utilizing social media. Um, we can name examples from uh, Russia, Ukraine, United States, Canada, Israel, China. All of ma all major countries use humor as part of public diplomacy um, in some way or the other. So we could be looking at embassy tweets, for example, that utilize humor. We could be looking at state broadcasters and state-owned media that try to promote a humorous message or even non-state um, actors. And very often humor is visual in these forms. So it could take a form of a meme or a tweet with an image, a cartoon. Um, and in a very short um, in a visual way, it uh, packages a lot of messaging, uh, which uh, can be about very, you know, very serious events and can contain very serious messages. There are a couple of um, tendencies which stand behind this. First of all, um, that news consumption today is increasingly reliant on social media, particularly for younger audiences. And younger audiences tend to um, gain most of their news online, and that news is um, increasingly emerging with entertainment. So, um, And we're talking about various formats in which uh, political comedy shows uh, or jokes or short videos, TikTok, contribute to the creation and reproduction of humor online. And this leads me uh, to the formulation of a concept um, of strategic humor, uh, the way that humor can be used by states, proxy and non-state actors in order to promote instrumental interpretations of events which can be contested to domestic and foreign uh, publics. So there are several key components in, in this um, idea of strategic use of humor in public diplomacy. One is that it is used to achieve foreign policy goals. So, for example, to frame events in a particular way, to deflect criticism or legitimate policy. Secondly, the choice of humor that um, is, is made because humor is accessible, memorable, um, it's easily shareable just by one click on social media. And in other words, humor catches attention, it maximizes outreach, and it engages audiences at the level of emotion. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to prove that this is fact that you're talking about, but through humor, you're going to gain attention, um, and um, that maximizes outreach um, and resonates at an emotional level. Also, humor makes it possible to talk about events and unite them with wider strategic narrative. So instead of just describing a single event and boring a number of you know, dry facts and dry statements, through humor, you can bring together things from popular culture to events in politics, and you can merge the meanings of the two to achieve um, a particular um, foreign policy aim. And finally, strategic deployments of humor can be an asymmetrical tool, a tool of influence where um, states with fewer resources or mistrusted states or states with uh, fewer military power can be uh, using this public diplomacy tool in order to resist um, hegemonic or dominant, um, uh, dominant assaults from uh, external assaults. So some of the examples of, of, of humor that I'm going to stop on uh, relate to several events. So one is the Salisbury poisoning scandal in 2018, where Russia was accused of um, committing a chemical attack on British soil. And Britain and some of the other countries expelled uh, a number of Russian diplomats from the country. So that, that was a tweet through which, through mockery and humor, uh, the Russian embassy responded that the temperature of Russian-Britain relations drops to minus 23, um, referring to the um, expulsion of 20 three diplomats, or um, an example like this, where uh, through visual form, ridiculing the position of uh, you know, accusations against, um, against the Russian government. 
Um, in some ways, um, there have been examples of how humor uh, from um, popular culture has been merged uh, to create a meaning for um, a serious meaning for politics. So, for example, again, um, based on, on that example of Salisbury poisoning, um, the Russian embassy used um, references to the Academy Award winning film Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, um, in which um, the, uh, the Russian embassy ridiculed Theresa May's uh, position and portrayed her as incapable of uh, solving um, solving the uh, crisis on British soil. Um, the US also uses humor widely in its uh, public diplomacy communications and embassy communications. This is an example from 2015, where um, the US embassy posted um, a proofread letter which appeared in a Russian news, uh, newspaper. Um, the newspaper uh, claimed that um, the letter was from the State Department and it showed support from uh, for LGBTI movements in, in, in Russia and destabilizing Russia. Um, and the, the US State Department and the US um, embassy ridiculed th these accusations by um, showing inconsistencies in the letter and uh, just uh, just to say that it wouldn't be written uh, by an English speaker. And um, below correcting the mistakes, uh, the US embassy said, Dear Izvestia, next time you are using fake letters, please send them to us. We will be happy to correct your mistakes. Sincerely yours, the State Department. So, and that is 2015. That is a message on Facebook. And look at the bottom, it's 28,000 likes. Um, almost 1,500 comments and 11,000 shares. So for, um, for a social media post, that is viral at the time. Um, so that, again, um, shows how uh, humorous uh, public diplomacy can be, um, can really spread. But I'm also um, looking not just in the, at the content and examples of how humor has been used in public diplomacy, but also the reception. How do audiences respond to it? And that's where I locate the clash, uh, the clash where public diplomacy may not be working the way it is um, supposed to work or it at least intended to work. One of the examples I'm looking at is the use of pranksters. Um, these are two prominent uh, pranksters which, um, on, on the Russian side which have pranked multiple Western politicians um, and tried to trick them into making unguarded statements. So the, you know, the essence of a prank is pretending to be somebody else. So they would call, they would um, do a video, uh, a, a Skype chat, or uh, they would do a Zoom call with um, some of the key politicians or key uh, NG, political NGOs, and they would uh, try to post as somebody else, somebody that these NGOs and these politicians would trust and open up to. So, for example, calling um, call, calling the British Prime Minister posing as uh, Zelensky, for example, um, or um, things like this. And um, on a number of occasions, they would um, they would be used in Russian foreign policy as as evidence, as proof, as if. Um, you know, Western governments are plotting against or are financing, uh, for example, movements in Russia against the government, etc. But one of the things that um, is um, quite uh, interesting is that when doing an audience reception study, and I, I, look, I, I did focus groups um, in both Russia and the UK on the perception of these calls, is that the messaging gets rejected on a rather unexpected um, reason. And the reason is that these guys do not look like real politicians. So, and that is the clash between humor intended as a tool of uh, proliferating public diplomacy messages, and then the reception of these messages by the audience, which says that, well, this is all funny, but this is not real. And why is it not real? Well, because politics is the domain of wise men and women in suits. So, um, and that is a contradiction, a, a paradox. There's a paradox of mistrust and reproduction here, which I have observed in, um, in the audience reception study. So on the one hand, there's widespread disbelief on, in both locations, saying that, well, this can possibly be true because the, you know, these, these politicians are really well informed. They know what they're doing. So how, how can they fall for a joke like this? Um, there could be confusion where short media coverage really doesn't do justice to, um, to the prank itself, and people become confused who told whom, who pranked whom, etc. But there's also a projection of wider narratives, like, for example, um, the Russian audience widely complained of pranksters being paid agents of some structures or just, you know, being boys having some fun. So what can you do? In other words, um, public diplomacy messaging that utilizes humor spreads really well, but surprisingly can be rejected because audiences have an idea of politics as a very serious domain. Um, but it can still be appealing and can still be reproduced, particularly if it creates a sense of moral superiority over the opponent. And that leads me to um, some of the ideas um, 
I'm working in uh, in in other projects where uh, the public perception in public perception of crisis, you're not looking for facts, you're not looking for accurate information, but rather for information which makes you feel in particular ways. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for the um, time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dimitri, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, and who are now turning back on their cameras in order to answer some questions that we've received from our audience. So let me perhaps pick up first on where Dimitri left us off, talking about you know, not just the framing or what's being offered through visual diplomacy, but then what's being received and where there might be some differences there. So one of our uh, audience members asked, for instance, Jennifer, about image fatigue. Right? There's the offering of these images, but how are people receiving these images when you're receiving so many different images and sometimes so many horrific different images um, or, or offering to our, our broader panel just to think, think more broadly about framing and, and what do we know about these issues and the potential discrepancies between the use of these visual diplomacy strategies, skillful use of these strategies, but then you know, possible differences on the side of the receivers. Who wants to start us off in answering that theme? Jennifer? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just say, I'll, I, I go back to my, my core phrase as always, it's an evolution, not a, not, not a revolution. Image fatigue has always been there. We saw it even with the first broadcasting of a war into people's houses, the Vietnam War, with with the, with the use of the television, you know, everyone one was attached to it uh, at the start, but people became, you know, to use the word, fatigued by it. Uh, we saw this um, when all eyes were on Afghanistan when the Taliban came in. We saw this uh, with Ukraine at the initial invasion; all eyes were on it, and we saw it now with Iran. So, as policymakers uh, and and those who wish to keep the eyes of the world on your cause, you know, you need to ask yourself the question, image fatigue is real, this is not going to go away. So what is it and what can we do to keep uh, new strategic aims and procedures out there? And one, one thing I will say is, one thing to note is to look at, at Zelensky. Now, I think there is image, uh, I, I don't want to say image fatigue, and, and I hate to use the word fatigue regarding a hot war, but it's, I'm just being a pragmatist in this. Um, Zelensky, though, if you notice, it is constant, it is a constant different use of mediums, constant different use of things. And if you look at the way he's zooming into the Golden Globes, he's using every different um turning of the year event and i think that's very very clever it's not just using the same thing over and over again it's he's not doing just his strategy he's using the strategy of the media and he's just joining that and and seeing what's popular so i think that's one way to overcome it so thank you jennifer do others want to jump in on this question theme yeah, I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump in quickly. I, I'll just say that it's not just the image fatigue, but um, very often just the politics fatigue and the fatigue of negative news. So um, where, for example, humor can become a way to break through uh, monotonous dry news about politics or negative news. If we look at the examples of war coverage and um, you know how long can audiences stay tuned on the war coverage, well, their attention wanes pretty quickly. Um, and um, so, for example, humorous messaging becomes a way to re-engage audiences, to um, re-engage them emotively. So not at the level of facts, not at the level of you know chronology or here's what happened today, but at the level of emo emotional and moral judgments as who is the good, who who are good, who are bad, um, who do you side with. So um, yeah, um, and in this way, humor can really liven up um, the um, the public diplomacy and messaging about politics. I uh, may add something to this as well. I think the way in which I think that, that the question of, of fatigue is, is real, especially when we talk about conflict, negative stories, you know, these kinds of things, you know, happen. But what I learned, because there is another study, and I have to, to jump to another meeting to talk about that, you know, later on, is that in the case of Ukraine, this is existential. They need to maintain the awareness of the West in order to, you know, uh, maintain support and so on. So what I discovered in my research, and that connects a little bit to Dimitri, but from a different perspective, is that, and I didn't expect that, is that Ukrainians are very good at using strategic humor. Strategic humor in the context of war, it's amazing because uh, what they managed to do in this case, 
to overcome the negativity of the destruction and the atrocity that happens uh, in their country is to use humor to brand themselves as a nation, to introduce themselves using cultural frames, Western cultural frames from uh, Simpsons, from Hollywood and so on. So I think they managed to overcome a little bit the tiredness and the fatigue of the Western audience when they see all that destruction in a way in which actually uh, they prove quite productive. So I think there's something to learn about uh, that uh, in a positive sense as a way in which uh, Dimitri is right that, you know, uh, strategic humor used in a bad context is not public diplomacy. What I've seen in the case of Ukraine is that uh, actually they managed to brand themselves. If you ask Westerners what they know about Ukraine, to what they knew about Ukraine two years ago, they would probably say nothing. But now they managed to introduce themselves. And one element of that introduction to Western audience of the rebranding is strategic humor. Through images. Thank you. Uh, you. The audience has many questions for you. So let me throw out a, a few more that, that speak to some of the themes that you've raised already. Let me put a, a couple together here uh, and you can choose which pieces you want to answer. One of the questions comes uh, about ethical considerations. What are some ethical considerations that people who are trying to deploy digital diplomacy should be thinking about? Let me pair that with another question um, that has to do with the, the dark side of digital diplomacy, right? And we know how digital diplomacy has been used to promote radical politics or recruit for violent extremism. And is digital diplomacy just using those same techniques for good, you know, that's just an intention shift, or is there something qualitatively different about how to use digital diplomacy for these more positive social change purposes? Let me not stop there, but add one more. One of our audience members asks, are there training programs for how diplomats might be able to do this better? Now it's your turn. Who's going to start? Um, I, I just wanted to say two things. Uh, I, I think that uh, visual narration or the use of images and visuals is something that diplomats continuously get better at. Um, if we look at 2015, for instance, about 30% of all British tweets had an image. Today, we're talking about 100%. So there are basically almost no content being published on major social media sites by diplomats without images. And this is something that foreign ministry continuously get better at. I would say that there are digital pioneers and digital laggers. So for instance, because of necessity, Ukraine has probably become a pioneer in the use of images. But also if you check out the uh, social media accounts of the UK Foreign Office or the Baltic states, they are using images in very, very sophisticated ways. Um, some of it for storytelling, some of it for framing, some of it for narrating state action. Uh, the question about is, is there something similar here to the dark side of digital diplomacy, I'd say that the common denominator is that images can drive emotions. So uh, different groups or different individuals can use images in order to drive very positive emotions or very negative emotions. And the ethical question, I think, comes in here because sometimes, for instance, I get the feeling during the Ukraine war that we have almost entered the phase of fetishizing war and fetishizing weapons of war, that they are glorified on social media, a lot of them on Ukrainian social media channels. And we have to be weary of the long-term impact of fetishizing uh, images of war and weapons of war online. Thank you, Alan. Just, just a couple more minutes. Would someone else like to weigh in on this question? I'll just weigh in on the 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 dark side in a, in a very brief sum up saying, look, te technology, in my view, is amoral. It's like the gun itself is amoral. It's the person who holds the gun and the person who decides to use the gun. Um, so digital diplomacy, it depends on how you use it. Of course, there's going to be a dark side. Of course, there's going to be those who use it for, with with. Um, ill intent, strategic aims and objectives. We've seen this, you know, countless times. Um, 
uh, around the globe by, by foreign ministries. And this is nothing new to diplomacy. There's, diplomacy has always had a dark side and a good side. It just depends on how they wish to promote their aims and, and objectives. So I wouldn't be boxing digital diplomacy into good or bad. I would be just looking at the intentions um, and the agendas behind those who use it. And then once you understand that, it's time to understand the tactics and strategies and how then you can combat them as a foreign ministry. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, you know, we have two minutes for me to wrap up this panel. So I think what I'm gonna do is just first acknowledge some of the questions that remain out there that we're not gonna be able to answer today, but so that we collectively know what's sort of on the agenda for things that we need to learn more about and potentially research. And a number of the questions actually have to do with the difference between still images and video, right? Something that we haven't talked yet about. Uh, other questions have to do more with this idea of resonance and how we choose images to resonate and evoke those emotions that you've talked about among audiences. We do, Cornelio, have a number of specific questions about avatars. So it sounds like you've certainly piqued interest there. Um, and certainly for the Center for Public Diplomacy, people continuing to seek resources as to how they might harness these digital diplomacy techniques to further their own work. So with that, I think what I have to do now is to thank all of our panelists for these really thought provoking conversations this morning, conversation starters. And I suspect people, including me, are gonna be reaching out to you afterwards to follow up. Let me equally thank the Center for Public Diplomacy for hosting this terrific event this morning, uh, speaking by the number of audience members we have. We certainly know the panel and the center has generated enormous interest. And then, of course, I would be remiss not to thank our audience uh, for whom we have to thank for this rich discussion that we've had afterwards. So thank you, everyone. I've learned a lot and I look forward uh, to another occasion in the future. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.